guys! Welcome back to another episode of Control Alt Career. I'm your host, Jennifer Ong, and in this podcast, I interview people who have taken a leap of faith and pursued an alternative career path in Asia. Before I get started today, I'd just like to let you guys know that I do have a one on one career coaching program. So if you're feeling unfulfilled or unhappy at your corporate job and looking to find a job that's a bit more fulfilling, then send me a message on Instagram at ongjennifer underscore, or feel free to reach out to me via LinkedIn. I'd love to see how I can help. The link to my Instagram page is in the show notes to today's episode. All right, let's get into today's episode. Today, I'm super, super excited to have Renee Chow here. You might know Renee from her very popular YouTube channel, Gothamista, where she covers beauty and skincare from a very scientific angle. And her channel has well over 650,000 subscribers. But did you know that before she started this YouTube channel, she actually started out her career as a buyer? First at the fashion retailer company, Toppy, and then at Hermes. And she actually eventually worked her way up to being the general manager of Hermes China. After that, she then started her own brick and mortar lifestyle store in New York City, selling everything from skincare, cosmetics, accessories, specialty toys, and more. And she eventually sold that business to Walgreens. So how did Renee transition her career and what led her to start her own YouTube channel after all of this? I'll hand over to Renee now to share her story. Hi, Renee. So lovely to have you join us here on the podcast today. I thought I'd start off with just some easy questions for you just to get you warmed up. Why don't we start off all the way at the beginning and start talking about how your career got started once you graduated from university? What was the first job you had? After graduating, I actually came back to Hong Kong and I started out as an assistant buyer for a fashion company. And that was really, really fun. I mean, it's not something that I thought was an option before. When I graduated, it really was about you have to go into a Fortune 500 company and you can't have fun, go into finance. So when I kind of discovered that this was something I could do, it was very exciting because it was almost like you're shopping for a living and it's all fashion. From that point on, I became a full-fledged buyer and just moved up from there. And did you study fashion in school? No, that wasn't a course that was even available for my liberal arts college, but I was more on the business side of it. So I didn't really have to have any creative input or anything like that. If you just have a good sense and if you're sort of good with numbers, then you can do this job. That's awesome. So it sounds like right off the bat, you found something that you really loved. Yeah, it was fun. And I didn't realize at the time that when you are buying the business really kind of depends on what you choose and what you pick. If you don't get a certain sell through, then you're stuck (laughs) with all the inventory. So you really are learning the business from a very fundamental level. So that was a real education. Whereas I feel like if I went into marketing or if I went to any other area, then I would have just only learned one side of the business. The part that I actually enjoyed the most, which is not what I thought I would enjoy, is every day you are looking at statistics. You're sort of looking at how things sold and how things went and sell through. And it's actually really fascinating, the whole analysis aspect of it, because it's rewarding. You immediately see the rewards of the work you put in. So if you made good choices and you see it doing really well and people are buying a lot of stuff, you feel really good about it. But you feel bad when you make the bad choices too, so... It was data science before data science was a cool job. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And it's not as glamorous as people think. You know, they're like, oh, you're in the fashion industry. And it's just not. It's not like that. (laughs) Okay, so you stayed on as a buyer for quite a period of time in two different companies as well. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Actually, this wasn't planned, but my first job as a buyer was with a mass market company. They targeted the nine to five working woman. And then after that, I went to luxury. So I started working for Hermes and I was a buyer there. And it was a completely different experience, but I'm actually glad I did it in that order. It wasn't deliberate, but it's something that when you start doing, you realize how valuable it is to see both sides because you have no concept of how different it is. I think starting out or doing mass market anything is a really valuable experience versus when you do luxury. When you do mass market, you're forced to work very close to the market. 
So it's a lot more exciting because everything moves so much faster. But also, I think you have a much better understanding of the business and its weight. It has to be a lot more organized. You're getting new shipments in all the time versus with luxury, especially European luxury, they shut down most of the year. So it's definitely different. Interesting. So you stayed at Hermes as a buyer and actually moved up into a GM role. How did you get yes. from that to the GM position? I guess performance, <laughs> you know, I want to say. But I think what happened was I'm dating myself here, but we wanted to open the first Hermes store in China. And now it's interesting because when I go to Shanghai, I see a Hermes store like every few blocks. There's so many. But we were doing that. And in order to do business in China, you have to have a local partnership. Because of that, we have to form a new company. And so I was the GM of that new company. The first store was in Beijing. And it was probably to date the most challenging thing I've ever experienced. Would you say that that was very different from your experience as a buyer? Or would you say actually there was a lot more similarities between those two roles? Well, the buying was still part of it because I had to do all the buying for that store. But it was challenging because of the more responsibility, like you are trying to get the right staff in and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, it was also such early days in China. So it was a whole different level of professionalism and thinking and trying to train. That was the challenge, just being in China. But I would say otherwise, the role was not that different because it was just one store. Very interesting. And yeah. did you want to move into the GM position? Absolutely. Because I was so young at the time. I was only in my 20s. So for me, that was when I was the most ambitious in my life. So it was kind of like, yes, give me the challenge. And at that age, I was so cocky, I guess. It was like, yeah, I can do this. No problem. <laughs> you just think you can do anything with zero experience. But you but did. I, well, yeah, but it was hard. I mean, you get humbled along the way. You're <laughs> like, wow, I actually don't know anything. I actually don't know how to do this. So you get beaten down a little, but it's good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's super cool. So did you stay on as a GM for a period? of time? I stayed on and then I came back to the Hong Kong store because at that point I was flying there like Monday to Friday and then coming back for the weekends. And it was really tough. So I sort of did what needed to be done. And then we really just needed to find someone local who could be there all the time. So then I came back to Hong Kong for a period of time. Still working at Hermes? Yes. Yes. Got it. Later on, you started your own store in New York. Tell us a little bit about how you transitioned from that to starting up your own store in New York. I think I've always been more entrepreneurial. I'm so grateful for my experience. And I truly believe that to give yourself the best chance, it's always very valuable to work for a corporation first because you learn very simple things, just structural things and fundamental things and management things, which are all very, very valuable. And you always want to go into your own business with some level of experience. For me, because I moved to the States, that was when I decided I'd really like to do my own thing. And again, I think to be entrepreneurial, you've got to be a bit blind as well. You have to be extremely brave, but also you have to not really have a full of understanding of what is to come because then maybe you'll never do it. But definitely, I think, you know, it's not for the risk averse, especially brick and mortar. <laughs> when it comes to brick and mortar retail and you're holding so much inventory and you have to pay rent and you have high overheads, you have to be brave. Hermes is a place with so many different categories. So I was very interested, not just ready to wear, but, you know, home things and just different departments, a whole hodgepodge of specialty and fun items. I did not see stores like that. And I felt like my background is retail and my passion is curation. So I was like, you know what? I would love to have a store that I would love to go to all the time. That's pretty much how that came about. So it was a bit like, hey, I just haven't seen this type of store in the US. I feel like with my background in retail, I'm able to create something like that in the market. Yeah, I was confident about my curation abilities because I think that is probably the most important part. Again, it's like what you have, what you bring to the store. Is it what people want? So I think just from a very, very basic place that I think I had it down. Everything else I did not. And this is where it's really important to make sure if you are an entrepreneur and you do go into something that you 
have a good team of people who can pick up where your weaknesses start. Whatever you're not great at, I know what my strength is. My strength is the curation. My strength is more conceptual, whereas I cannot do administrative things. I'm not great with accounting and numbers and all that kind of stuff. So I had a great business partner because they had the opposite strengths. So it was a good compliment and we weren't bleeding over each other's different allotted categories of responsibility. And how did you go about finding your business partner? We were friends, actually. That's usually not something I would ever recommend yeah, for was... anyone to go into business with your friend. But I think because we have such different strengths, I wouldn't end up arguing with what I trusted that he knew better than me. And he wouldn't go arguing with me about things that he trusted I knew better than him. I think that's a situation in where it can work. Otherwise, it can be a great challenge working with friends. And how did you test out whether or not you guys would be good working together? That is such a great question. It's hard to test. I think when you know someone long enough, then you can see very clearly whether or not you can work well together. It's like a marriage. You can't be 100% sure, but you can also be quite sure that the chances are better than a stranger. You won't have as many surprises as just bringing on it a total stranger who could end up doing anything. So I think for me, as long as you have the trust, that's a good place to start because you're just never going to know how someone's going to react to a situation that's new to you and them. I will say this, Jen, you have to go into it kind of like a marriage with a prenup. I'm not saying everyone needs one and everyone should get one, but in the case of a business partner, you definitely need a solid one that lays out before you even start exactly what's going to happen in the event of really anything, how you vote on something and what happens if you don't agree. All that stuff needs to be laid out beforehand. That really helps. Don't go into it with like, oh, let's just put something on a piece of paper and sign it. That is going to be the cause of a lot more conflict when it's not properly laid out and discussed. So that is a must in addition to the trust. So if I can think of two important fundamentals, you just really have to trust this person and you just have to have a good agreement or a contract between you two. That's really, really good advice. For this person, were you just bouncing ideas off with your business partner at that point in time? Or were you like more deliberate? Were you like, hey, I see what this person brings to the table. They're bringing in things that I'm not strong at. So maybe I should just ask them to partner with me. I already was speaking to this person about my plans. And so they already knew. It wasn't like I just thought, oh, he would be great. So I'm just going to ask him. I didn't even think about it. I didn't think I was going to bring on a partner, to be honest. The partners that I was considering bringing on were just purely silent, not active, but they're able to purchase shares. So I could have some funding because retail stores require a lot of funding. That was kind of what I was thinking about. I was thinking of just hiring everyone else. But then when a startup, it is important to have partners too, because then it does cut down significant, significant costs. To answer your question, it happened quite organic. I was just sort of telling my friend, this is what I want to do. And then we are bouncing ideas off. And then it happened organically from there because he was open to it as well. So you have basically found a business partner. You are committed to this idea. How did you get it up and running. Prior to that, I was going to a lot of trade shows. And that wasn't unusual for me because I've always been a buyer. So it was really all about the logistical stuff, like getting the inventory, making sure your store is fitted out in a way that you want it to look. So I had to get an architect. I had to get interior person, hiring people. That might have been the easiest part, hiring people, because you're really just getting bodies, I guess, to help you, especially with sales staff. They do kind of rotate very, very often. So if anyone decides to do a business where they have to have a lot of sales staff, I would say don't stress out too much about getting the perfect candidates because usually they don't stay around for too long anyway, and you're never going to get the perfect candidate. <laughs> I think with things like uh, brick and mortar retail or any service industry, you kind of have to have one eye closed. Otherwise, you'll just get too frustrated. <laughs> It's hard to be a perfectionist in this space. It really is because <laughs> you depend so much on other people, right? And if everyone isn't a perfectionist, then you're going to drive yourself mad if you care too much. How did you know how to even find a space, get an architect, hire people? Was this all stuff that you learned when you were setting up the first store in Beijing for Hermes? I would say yes. I opened at this point so many stores that it's kind of easy. I think when it comes to actually finding the people though, that really 
comes down to your own research. Friends are always a great resource because everyone always knows somebody. You just have to do your own research when it comes to finding the people, the architect or the interior person, and just really kind of talking to a whole bunch of different companies or people who could do the job and just see if you align. If you feel a connection, then usually you should go with that because that is kind of hard to find sometimes. What did the store stock? Like share share a little bit is, more about your store. It was kind of like a lifestyle emporium at a high-end neighborhood pharmacy on the Upper West Side. And we actually had a really large celebrity base, which was fortuitous. That's not something I planned either, but because of our location, we had a large celebrity base, which was really cool. It was kind of exciting. The pharmacy that we had did compound medications. So that means if your dog needs medication, then we would put it in like dog food. Like we'll make it into something that was very powerful for them. Or if your kids needed medication, we would make them into gummy bears. And that was something that was very rare in New York. There are not many compound pharmacies that kind of differentiated us, but also there were different departments. We had a specialty toy department that and the pharmacy ended up being the most stable departments that actually kept going up in sales. We also had a lot of like beauty, so skincare, cosmetics, and We also had accessories and just general gift items. I definitely focus more on indie brands. I enjoy indie brands so much because I grew up with all the department store brands. But for me, being in the States, being exposed to independent brands was such a thrill. I love treasure hunting. And so I focused very much on that, just discovering new brands, whether it's candles, whether it's body products or skincare. And what I love is that New York, it's very different from Asia. Asia likes to stick with their department store luxury brands, but in New York, people love discovering new things. So they didn't have that kind of brand attachment. They just wanted new innovations, new technologies, and just kind of support the smaller businesses too. You guys were mostly in brick and mortar. Did you ever think about going online? I personally, as a consumer, appreciate brick and mortar. I mean, we live in cities. You love walking in and seeing and all that stuff. But in general, in the time that I did have the brick and mortar, I feel like that business model just became very out of date. This was the early 2000s. So it was when Amazon just became a thing. But you also had like Groupon. You had all these different business models, but mainly just the DTC business model too which made me so envious because people were able to do very well without the time, the energy, and the mostly monetary commitment that you have to make when you have a brick and mortar store. I realized that my business model was in order to have the whole online thing, when you have a specialty store, it doesn't work as well because you're not necessarily carrying so much consistent inventory. You kind of change every once in a while. You change it up a lot. So it's a whole nother business. And then how do you compete with some of the prices? It's hard to compete against an Amazon if you're a specialty store. So during that period of time, it was just not something that you were considering. It required like a whole new skill set. Like a whole new business. Jen, you came to my store and you see how much inventory we had, right? We had so many different departments that it would have been a huge undertaking. I would have had to make it a totally separate business with a different concept, a different inventory. It is interesting for me to think about what it would have been like to just have a very specialty online store, because there are definitely ones that I'm a big fan of, mostly in the beauty space. But yeah, it definitely would have had to have gone down that route. But the good thing is that right around that time is when I had the opportunity to sell. And so in a way, it kind of saved me from going in further. I do want to get into how you managed to sell to Walgreens. But before we do all of that, when you were first setting up this store, did you feel any sort of imposter syndrome or were you like nervous putting in so much? Very nervous. But then I think at some point you're so excited about what you're building. And I think that's the wonderful thing about building something as opposed to when you're just working for someone is that whole adrenaline or the rush of watching what you're creating materialize and even change. You know, it was mostly just a very satisfying experience and an exciting experience that I became very proud of because you do learn and grow as you go along, but also you see something that literally came from nothing. You see people going in there and buying it and you see the way everything kind of grows and changes, whether you make money or not that part is really satisfying. You can't regret that, you know? Did you always know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Actually, no. 
So I truly believe that being an entrepreneur is something that's just deep within you. Two types of people, entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs. And I respect both. If you're someone who's always calculating risk and always weighing, well, if I leave my job, that means I lose this money. And, and if I start something new, there's no guarantee that I will ever make up to that same amount. If you're going to get caught up on all that thinking and that it's actually going to affect your life, then entrepreneurship is going to be scary as hell. But if you're not risk averse, you have the luxury of not having to worry too much about it. Like you have the support and the funding and you understand that things may not go according to plan. And you also know that it may take a certain amount of time before you even break even, then it can be super exciting and satisfying. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is another thing that I find every single time I try something new is that what you end up with isn't necessarily what you start out with. So whatever your initial plan is, you I think you have to be very flexible and open-minded that as you're going through the process, you may discover that your original plan wasn't the best. If you can just go with the flow and move with where this business is kind of evolving into, then I think you'll be far better off than just sticking with, nope, it has to be this way. You have to be open-minded, I think. I guess when you first envisioned starting up the store, you probably never thought you would sell it to Walgreens. I didn't. I didn't even have an exit plan. So I'm a terrible example of entrepreneurship, but I didn't have an exit plan. I just thought that this was something that was just going to keep growing and growing and growing. And the whole Walgreens thing came about because it was just pure luck, really. At the time, Walgreens was never part of the East Coast. They were always more of like a West Coast chain and business. So they came into New York and they actually gave us an offer. It happened right in our last year before our lease came up. It was meant to be. Yeah. The universe was like, this. you need to move on from this now. Yeah. You know? Would you be able to share a little bit on how much you invested into the business in the early days? And when you exited, did you make money from it? I'm not quite sure how to honestly and simply answer that question. But I will say that being bought out did allow us to leave with profit. I feel like had we gone on, that it would have gotten harder and harder. And I'll say this, every day that the pandemic has been around, I've been so grateful not to have brick and mortar. Because with brick and mortar, you just cannot predict what will happen. Uh -huh. So being able to sell at the time that we did was just perfect. It allowed my partner and I just to relax for a while before we decided what we were going to do next. Cool. So you sold your business. What were your plans, I guess, after you sold the business? So I think I was so burnt out that I was like, I have no plans. I'm like, give me a break. Let me just relax. You know, I think after you have your own business, it's hard to go back to working for someone else. But finding something that I can be so passionate about, that takes some time. Also, I promised myself that whatever I did had to be very new because I didn't want to be caught in a situation again where I was doing something that was becoming more and more outdated. And so what happened was one of my girlfriends was at the time the head of NBC Digital because she knows I'm a buyer and I basically always tell her what to get. So she's someone who's always loved my suggestions. And so she's the one who sent me some YouTube videos. And she's like, this is what you should do. And I'm like, what's so far from anything that I even conceived of doing? Because number one, I don't like putting myself out there. I'm an extremely private human being. And I don't know anything about video editing. And also these were kids doing it. You know, it's a bunch of young millennials, Gen Zs. And I felt like I, I had no place in this world. And also I wasn't familiar with it. The way she put it was like, look at these kids talking about products. They don't come from an educational place, right? Whereas you're such an expert in curation. So you would actually know what you're talking about. You should do this. It took me a year and a half before I really warmed up to the idea. So I did it for fun. I figured maybe I'll do a video once every few months and just give myself this amount of time to play around with this. And if it's something that I lose interest in or it doesn't work, then I can just move on. But I wasn't thinking about the monetary aspect. I was just thinking about, hey, I'm going to learn something new. I get to be creative and this could be a hobby. So that's pretty much how it started. So you were definitely over the brick and mortar retail space. space. I was done with that. No, okay, so the whole management part is very difficult. But the main issue was just carrying inventory is something that I decided I just don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to be in a position where I'm carrying so much inventory, but also I just don't want to have to depend on 
staff. The next thing I do, I just want to be able to take a break of that. Because if I think about what stressed me out the most in my work, it was probably management and inventory. I'm interrupting my very own episode to let you guys know that I have a one-on-one career coaching program that's designed to help you go from lost and frustrated with your corporate job to living and crushing and knowing what your dream career looks like. So if you too want to be like Renee and build a career or even multiple careers that you love, well, send me a message or follow me on Instagram at ongjennifer underscore. That's O-N-G. J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R underscore for more information. The link to my Instagram profile is also in the show notes to today's episode. All right, back to the episode. Okay, with YouTube, you started creating a few videos on sheet masks and Korean beauty. How did that all kind of happen? The YouTube thing at that point, I was unaware that there was any way to make money that way. I was going through an exploratory phase where I was trying to discover myself again. YouTube was just one of the things that I was willing to explore without expectation, truly. The timing was great because my first few videos were about Korean sheet masks and just K-beauty. I did not realize that in the West, it was such a huge topic. People were so curious about K-beauty. Also, K-beauty was so much fun and the packaging and everything was just so entertaining. So that is what I feel made my content take off. From that point on, you start building a community and then people start saying, I want to see this and I want to see this. So then you end up doing it more often. It was kind of an organic growth. Otherwise, I would not be producing content as often as I do. I never had imposter syndrome until now because it is bizarre to me that so many people want to watch my content. (laughs) Why would anyone want to watch this? But then people do and they enjoy your content. At some point, it's just pure community driven. People tell you exactly what they want and it gives me ideas. It encourages me. It inspires me and it drives my content. What made you decide to start off with beauty products? Because you've done curations in all sorts of spaces and you have background in fashion. Why did you pick beauty to do your YouTube video? That is honestly the best question ever. Originally, I didn't plan to just do beauty. It was supposed to be a lifestyle brand. I was thinking of doing some cooking videos as well as all these other categories of, of products. But the overwhelming response was for beauty. And that was something that I knew really, really well because I was also involved in product development. When I had my own store, we also created a line. So I understood it very well. And I think because I understood it really well, I was able to give a a deeper background. I can just dive deeper and help people understand what ingredients are and all that stuff. So it ended up being educational content, which never in my life did I expect people would watch. I thought people just wanted entertainment. One day there was a brand that came out called The Ordinary. And I was like, okay, people need to understand what these weird scientific names are and what they do. So I did a video that was probably 17 to 20 minutes long and I edited it as much as I could. And then I thought, I'm just going to leave it as is. Otherwise, I'm oversimplifying. And that ended up probably being my most popular video. And five years from now, people are still watching it. So that's when I realized it actually shifted the way I do content. People wanted education. You have no idea how many times I get corrected on the way I pronounce things. Oh, really? (laughs) I have a formulator friend, a chemist. And so now before I say something, I always double check. I'm like, like, is is this this how you pronounce it? Is it Baku Kyle or Baku (laughs) Chial? And him being a true scientist, he's always like, it doesn't even matter. That's hilarious. But that's so cool. You said that you kind of got into all of this because you did product development for your store previously. Maybe share a little bit about that. What was your background and your experience there? When people are trying to sell to you their new line, they do give you a whole training on formula and stuff like that. So you do kind of get um, an idea about key ingredients and what's special. But then the whole product development side was a whole different animal because you understand more about the chemistry. So you realize that things just aren't that simple. And you also understand that any decision you make can affect the entire formula. And not just that, you understand pricing too. The fact is there are certain ingredients that are really expensive. And then there are other ingredients that are just not. So you just get a much better understanding of 
beauty, skincare in general, you get a much better understanding of the way things work and a better appreciation of the formulas that don't compromise versus the ones that are like 90% water. What was the product that you developed back then? It was body products, body wash, body creams, some luxurious scrubs and a lip balm. I love lip balms. So we had to make one of those. And yeah, it was mostly just sort of pampering body spa type products. And what made you go down that path? Because that's quite different developing your own product in your own line versus buying. Yeah, because it was such a popular category in the store. We would sell more body products than maybe anything. And so I remember going to a trade show and just being very, very inspired. And then I kind of figured this could be really profitable if we had our own private label. I mean, a lot of stores do it for a reason. For me, it was just out of pure curiosity and thinking, hey, this is a strategy. So that's when, you know, we developed our own product line and it is just more profitable. How did you find the manufacturer or did you have any sort of background in chemistry? I had none, but I did two things. I had a chemist. So a chemist actually formulated from scratch. That was amazing. And she would explain to me all the time, like, well, if you make this choice, then you have to da, 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 do this and this and this. But that was like a dream working with a chemist. But then I also had a contract manufacturer. And a contract manufacturer basically is what I believe most brands do. One of the biggest contract manufacturers is Korean. So that's why a lot of skincare products you find are very, very similar because they're probably from the same contract manufacturer. What they do is they have already ready-made formulas for you and you can purchase those ready-made formulas. They've already been tested. They've already been perfectly formulated and you get to make small changes like do you want to add a scent to it? Or do you want this to be fragrance free? There are allowances for cosmetic and small changes, but for the most part, it's already ready made. So if you want a body line in three months, then that's the route you would go. But to properly formulate something from scratch, it would take a few years, but I did both. So I can tell immediately when something's contract manufactured versus a formula that has been largely made by a chemist that's, you know, unique. I think that that's such an interesting and unique background that you have. And I think that probably comes across a lot in terms of your YouTube videos. You really, really do understand the product because you went through the process of building a product yourself. What your viewers really love about you is just your intense knowledge behind all of this. I think, as you also mentioned earlier, what you start off with and what you end up with is so different. When you were deciding to start this line, I don't think you ever envisioned that it would one day be something that would be useful in terms of you starting up Never. a YouTube channel. <laughs> Absolutely. No. You're so right. Now doing what I'm doing, I'm like, thank goodness I tried all of that. It's a continuation. Let's just say that it's a continuation. It's not like, oh, I just ended this chapter of my life. The side question I had, how did you find the chemist? And how did you find this like contract manufacturer? How did you just go from, I'm going to build a product to like actually building the product? You meet a lot of people in the industry along the way when you've been buying for so long, especially with the new brands and the independent brands, you can really develop a good relationship with the brand owners. And so basically it came from the connections that I built as a buyer. The indie market is so special, especially amongst the founders, because everyone is so generous with information. If they have friends that do great work or if they love their own chemist and they want them to continue to grow, they want to share them all their knowledge and stuff like that. So that was kind of wonderful, just making the connections I've made and continue to within this industry. As for the contract manufacturer, that comes from going to a lot of trade shows and doing a lot of research. But the trade shows, I think, really helped because they're all there. Mm -hmm. So those are great resources. I think that's really great advice for people who are maybe thinking about starting their own beauty line or just getting into that space. Go to trade shows. Absolutely. It's where you Go can meet a lot shows. of yeah, interesting people who would be able to help you out with this. Cool. So bringing this back to YouTube, you created a bunch of videos. People really loved your videos. When did you realize that this could be a thing that you could do full-time? I had nobody who was familiar with what I did. It took a long time for me to discover that you can actually monetize this. And I think that really worked to my advantage because for the first two years of me doing this, I didn't monetize at all. And also because I worked before and had very well-paying jobs, I didn't sell out easily. 
if someone said, we'll give you $200 to talk about this, I'd be like, no, thanks. I'll buy it myself and I'll talk about it. I think for me, that worked to my advantage that I didn't really start monetizing until much later. There are really three ways to monetize YouTube. You can turn on Google ads. So an ad will pop up whenever someone views your video. The second way is through an affiliate partnership or affiliate links where you make a commission, you get paid or you get something every time someone clicks on that link. And the third way you can monetize is when you are directly sponsored by a brand and you're working on a collaboration with a brand. The reason why I did start monetizing is because I got to work with some of my favorite brands. When a brand that you've loved for so long wants to work with you, I jump at the opportunity. It's like an honor and it makes me very happy to do that. With you saying no, do you feel like you were able to maintain that sort of integrity in your videos that then like led you to even more people watching? And because you didn't rush to monetize, you were able to build that even stronger trust. connection and trust, trust. with yeah. your viewers. Yeah, I have no agenda when I do my reviews at all. And particularly then, I think there was so much skepticism around sponsored content. It absolutely helped me out not monetizing. In fact, what ended up happening is there were people who were like, can you please, please put affiliate links? I want to support you. And that's when I was like, wait a minute, affiliate links? What are those? <laughs> like, If you have the trust of your viewers, affiliate links are definitely lucrative because basically you are getting commission from everything that sells. Sometimes you have affiliate partnership with brands, which I prefer. I prefer to have that kind of partnership over sponsorship only because you feel like people have a choice. They can either support you and buy from your link or not. And I like that. But also you sort of get what you deserve. People who want to support you, that's where you are gaining from. Would you be open to sharing with affiliate links just a sense of what we're talking about? Gosh, every creator has their own thing that they bring to the table and they all monetize differently, which is why I don't want to set up expectations for people. So for me, I'm not doing personal vlogs. Nobody's watching my content to see what's going on in my life. They watch my content to know what to buy. So for me, affiliate links is something that on a monthly basis can really make enough for me to live off of very comfortably. You're not getting a consistent salary. There are certain months that are just going to do much better for you. And then there are certain months that may not do much for you at all. But if you were just to take it as an aggregate whole, I, I make more now than I did when I had a corporate job, which was honestly a huge surprise to me. That's honestly amazing. Do you feel like it was because you were able to build such a strong following that you were able to enjoy such financial rewards? Or do you feel like the average person on YouTube actually could be making a good amount of money as well. I mean, there are 16 year olds that are making multiple times what I'm making. But also I, I get your question. There's a large focus on micro influencers on brands. And when I say micro influencers, I'm talking about like 10,000 followers or less because they have the strongest, most engaged community. Whereas the larger influencers, there just tends to be less engagement anyway. Sometimes People just don't bother commenting because you already have so many people commenting. But the micro-influencers are the ones that have a very focused community. So there is a big focus on that. I think you have to focus on community. That is the most important part of social media, in my opinion. And that's probably the most rewarding part is just being able to interact with people and building this place where you all have the same interest and the same goals and also where you can really learn from one another as well. I think one of the biggest fears that people have is, hey, if I try to do YouTube full time, that I'm setting up too much of a financial expectation for myself to succeed. And so people get nervous to even start going onto YouTube because they're like, oh, I may never be able to enjoy that sort of financial success. I guess I'm just trying to understand that. what is the spectrum of success for YouTube? Yeah. I mean, my advice would be when you start out, don't quit your job. If, if you need to survive and then test it out that way. The fact is so many people right now are full-time YouTubing and it's hard to say what that level is because it's different for everybody, right? Some people take four years, some people can do it really quickly. So it is a risk, which is why it's always good to make sure that you don't decide to quit your job and do this exclusively from scratch because there's always going to be lead time. You really are building. 
I actually think the best way to do it, and this is not how I did it, but obviously in hindsight, I would build a community first on Instagram or any other social media. These people at least will convert. You have to be patient with it. It's a slow build, but then there is a reward at the end of the tunnel if you are consistent and you're able to build that sort of following and that community. Yeah, absolutely. The one thing you don't want to do is fall into this trap where I see this a lot, actually, people who quit their jobs because they want to really be serious about YouTube. You just end up seeing ads all the time. You don't want to get into that spot where you just become an ad. Every piece of content you put out, it's just an ad. Unless that is your goal, you know, that's fine too. There's no judgment there at all. But you don't want to run the risk of, well, I have to make money. So I just have Mm -hmm. to say yes to everything. The financial pressure, that is actually even a strain on your content because because you have to develop content around one thing. And it may not be the most organic content for you. During that period of time before you were monetizing YouTube or before you realized that you could have a career in this space, what were you thinking? Were there other roles or opportunities you were considering? I think I was just so surprised by how much response I was getting. And this took so much of my time. I was doing everything on my own. My type of content can't be edited by anyone but myself because I'm talking, you know, so only I will know what fits and what doesn't fit in. I was so encouraged by the response and I was so happy to make all this content. I really wasn't thinking about anything else. It was just like I was in build mode. You know what I mean? I was just purely in build mode. Got it. And how long would you say it takes for you to create one of these YouTube videos? It's the prep work. I think that takes the most time. I need to gather everything that I'm going to focus on. But also it's like thinking, okay, so what is a good topic? And then I think about what I'm going to say and highlight about each of these things. The filming itself is a few hours, but then afterwards the editing takes quite a long time. I would say maybe for me, because I'm kind of slow at least two days Mm -hmm. to get everything. Have you ever thought about hiring someone to do the editing? I, I do have someone helping me now on certain things that are easy to do. But unfortunately, I still have to do the main kind of, all right, let's get rid of this entire thing. There's certain things that I don't think anyone else can be able to determine. But yeah, I've already kind of unloaded some of the work, which has actually made a huge difference. So I hope to get to a point where I can unload a lot of it so I can focus on more new things, more yeah. content. I guess beauty is one of those things that you're clearly like very passionate about and has resonated very strongly with your audience. Do you think you'll ever expand into anything beyond beauty? I think so, but we'll see. There are times where people always ask me about what I wear and I was like, maybe I should do some outfit videos, but then I would feel so weird doing it because I don't like pictures taken of me. But I I do think that I'm definitely going to sort of expand it because you just get questions about things, you know, handbag collections, jewelry, favorite perfumes, where I get my clothes from and and things like that. One that gets asked a lot, but it's kind of an undertaking is what I eat in a day. Mm -hmm. I think people just love seeing what people eat in a day. Those are popular videos. Diet also connects with beauty very well as well, because what you eat and what you put into your body is probably also Mm -hmm. what's going to show up on your skin too. So Mm -hmm. I can kind of see that on that vein. What what do you think is next for your YouTube channel or even beyond your YouTube channel? I have certain plans, but I'm not ready to talk about them yet, only because Mm -hmm. they're thoughts. It could be something completely different or it could be something new like an an expansion of what I do. People ask me all the time, when are you going to come out with your own products? Yeah. And it seems like the most logical thing to do, but maybe it's because I'm a little overwhelmed with all the product that exists. And I enjoy reviewing and trying great formulas that almost feel like, how am I going to add to this already saturated, oversaturated market. So I think if I were to come out with a product, it would have to be something just so selfish. Like this is what I want. This is what I would create for myself. And by the way, if you guys want to try it out, feel free. But ultimately I created this for me, you know, that type of thing. And that's probably the best way to go as well, right? Because that's kind of how the YouTube channel also started and also how your store kind of started. Seems like that's kind of worked for you right, <laughs> so it's far. So fluid, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it only makes sense that that would be why or how you would start a new line if you ever do decide to go down that path. Have you ever considered TikTok? TikTok's a hard word. By the way, we can't even do TikTok here. In, in Hong, Hong Kong. Kong. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is interesting. <laughs> I've considered it. I just don't know how to do it in a way that fits me, you know, because I'm not going to dance. I have to find a way to do it that 
feels comfortable for me to do. Seems like that's kind of where social media is all moving towards. And yeah, it seems like a lot of people are jumping on that TikTok train. (laughs) I mean, even Instagram, right? Like everyone's trying to compete with TikTok. So it's the whole short form video. So Instagram's doing it. YouTube now has short form and Mm. Facebook, if it doesn't already have it, probably will. Everyone's moving towards that to try and compete with them. You know, it's hard to shorten my videos because sometimes information just needs to be more thorough. But I do think that there is a place for short form. I just have to learn how to have the time to just do it and do it effectively. There's so many YouTube channels out there nowadays, and especially even in the beauty space, there's so many different beauty vloggers. How do you feel like you have been able to differentiate yourself or to stand out from the rest of them? Well, I think, first of all, my age, that's a huge difference because there are a lot of people in the space that are very young. I've been around in this industry for so long that I remember when new innovations came out and and I've been exposed to so much. So there's history that I understand, but also I can really, really compare because I've tried so many things. And I can talk to certain concerns, which could be aging concerns. I can talk about hyperpigmentation. I can talk about preservation and things like that in a way that is truly to my experience. Makes sense. I just wanted to shift to kind of the last portion of the interview. If you could go back in time before you went on this whole journey, what would you tell yourself to do, if anything, differently? That's a great question. I don't have any regrets because I feel like the paths I went on were really my own. I wasn't really influenced by anybody. So in a way, I feel like I've been the architect of my career thus far. I think the best part of being where I am now is that I got to choose. You know, I just followed my path and stayed true and authentic to what I really believed. And I I challenged myself. I really, really challenged myself. So whether it turned out great or whether it didn't turn out great, you know, I can be okay with it. I I love that. And a question that I do ask all of my guests on the podcast is, you know, in the Western world, people usually say, follow your dreams and eventually the money will come. Whereas I think in Asia, it's much more around, hey, we got to be financially stable, got to have like a corporate job, make money, etc. And I know that you've spent time in both the Western side in the US and also in Asia. So kind of just wanted to hear your thoughts on the statement. I mean, there's a part of me that's like one side is too practical and one side's too head in the clouds dreamy, but I do tend to go more towards the practical side. If you stay true to your dreams, it may lead you to where you need to be, but you have to be open-minded to that. Nothing that I set out doing ended up being what I ended up doing. It became some iteration of it. You have to be open-minded, but you have to really work hard. And to an extent, you have to go in with both eyes open. You have to be the wisest you can possibly be and be prepared. Like, don't go in thinking, you know what, as long as I do what I believe in, I don't have to worry too much about a security net or anything like that. You have to have a plan and be responsible. That's what I believe. Make sure that what you want to do is something that you can monetize and that can work out for you. If you do have something you dream about doing that you think would be so much fun, then plan it out. Make sure you're making wise decisions, but also don't be stubborn about it too. Even the businesses that we know today that are successful, they have to keep evolving just to stay relevant or keep up with the way the rest of the world is evolving. And the world is evolving faster now than I can ever remember. People are losing interest in in new things really quickly. So I think learn how to pivot in a way that will be financially beneficial for you. But also, like I said, don't quit your day job immediately. And do have enough that even if you don't make profit for a few years, you'll be okay. On that note, how do you think through how much you need to have saved up before pursuing something that may not be immediately lucrative? How did you yourself think through that financial decision? You have to do a budget. You have to do a business plan, right? It doesn't have to be an extensive one, but just do a brief business plan, do your research. And I accounted for three years of no profit. So will I be able to survive for three years? If I can, all right, I'll go for this. But if I can't, and I need to be making profit like within the first six months, then that's risky. Mm -hmm. That's definitely risky. Three years is just kind of a very standard amount of time 
that is used when people are doing business plans. I think it's a good ballpark because if you have big plans and you want to hire people, you want to do things properly, you want to pay people and you want to rent out an, an office space, I think three years is always a good hedge. Got it. Makes sense. Just ending off with any last parting words or pieces of advice that you might have for our listeners today, maybe more specifically on people who are thinking about starting their own business or starting their own YouTube channel, what advice would you have for them? I would say don't be so concerned about getting everything perfect before you try something new because it's just not going to be perfect. If you're waiting for the right time and you're waiting for everything to be 100%, you will never start. I think just dive in with what you have, because at least you're putting a foot forward and you're getting in there. Am I going to have all the equipment that I need to do YouTube? As long as you have a phone and you have a window, you're going to be good. But also you may plan for the perfect everything, but you may be led a different direction. So you just always have to plan for flexibility, but just start somewhere. You know, you don't have to be 100%. I love it. I think getting it done is better than getting it done perfectly. Cool. So on that note, thanks for spending so much time with us here today on the podcast. It was really, really great talking to you today, Renee, and just hearing about your very fascinating career journey. So just a huge, huge, huge thank you for sharing your story with us. No, thank you. And there you have it. My conversation with Renee. Here's a couple key takeaways that I got from today's conversation. One, as an entrepreneur, it is important to know what your strengths and weaknesses are. Once that's clear, you can then put together a team to pick up where your weaknesses start. For Renee, when she was starting up her brick and mortar store in New York, she knew that her strengths lay in creation and the design of the store. But what she wasn't as strong in was accounting and finance. That's why she found a business partner with complementary skill sets. But one thing she does caution is do take time to find the right business partner. This partnership is almost like that of a marriage. It is also super important to lay out a contract or an agreement beforehand, which can be very, very helpful when conflicts do inevitably arise. Two, when it comes to building a career in social media, focus first and foremost on building a community. This can be done by creating content that provides so much value and service to your audience that they are actually looking for ways to support you and pay you for your work. In today's age, this is what brands favor and prioritize over follower count. Three, if you're thinking about starting your own business and wondering how much of a nest egg you need, Renee advises you to be prepared to survive for three years with no profit. And lastly, For those of you looking to start your own business, Renee says, don't be so concerned with getting everything perfect or waiting for the right time. Just start with what you have. Also, be flexible and open-minded because what you set out to accomplish may not always be what you end up with in the end. For example, Renee never expected her YouTube channel could ever become a full-time career. She started off just dabbling in it and did it for fun as she was trying to figure out the next step in her own career. And this is something that I always tell my students in my coaching program as well. If you're feeling lost and directionless in your own career, just do something about it. Whatever it is, whether it's starting a YouTube channel or a drop shipping company or any other side hustle, just try. Do something about it. You never know what can come out of it. And that's it for this week. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Control Alt Career. Check back in two weeks' time for the next episode, where I'll be interviewing Vinny Ong, who founded Happy Human, a company that's fighting back against single-use plastic by creating refillable and reusable household cleaning products in tablet form. And if you liked today's episode, do share with two friends who maybe aren't so happy with their perfect on paper corporate job and need a little extra inspiration to leave that behind. I also have a one-on-one coaching program. So if you or your friends are not too happy with your job and looking to build a side hustle or even to completely switch careers like so many of the guests on my podcast, feel free to reach out to me or follow me on Instagram at ongjennifer underscore for more information. Thanks for tuning in as always. I'll see you guys back here in two weeks.